Hello, and welcome to QuantPy. In this video, we are going to introduce the Brownian motion. In the next few presentations, we will explore the mathematical properties of the process, in more detail. The story of Brownian motion started about two centuries ago, when a Scottish botanist, Robert Brown, while examining the grains of pollen suspended in water, observed that these particles, were in continuous jittery motion. The particles were seen to be moving places in the fluid, turning around the axis, and sometimes changing forms, such as contracting. The motion was described to be irregular, and independent. He then found, similar motion in grains of pollen of other plants. We show a generic particle in a three-dimensional container to help visualize the phenomenon. Just imagine seeing this for the first time. You would probably think that you are onto something very elementary, such as the very meaning of life or maybe even the origin of life. There was then, the question of whether, these particles are alive, or vital as they put it. To cut a long story short, Brown had found the motion in both organic, and inorganic particles, ruling out the question of vitality. A number of explanations were offered as causes of the motion. The list could be made as long as one like, but we will mention, only few. Evaporation, mutual attractions and repulsions of particles, unstable equilibrium, capillary action, currents in the fluid, busting of volatile matter, such as air bubbles. Imagination knows no bounds. But these explanations could not stand a chance as we had a guy, who was in love with his microscopes, and had access to all sorts of fluids and particles, minerals, plants, animals, living, dead, and bruised. And he could mix, and match, and burn and dry. The result is predictable then. He ruled out most of these explanations with some simple, but ingenious experiments. This was 1828. Now what happens in the next 80 years, or so? Very little, as far as the development of the theory of Brownian motion is concerned. Most of the development, if any, was qualitative in nature. Whilst one can find references which give correct characterization of some of the properties or aspects of the Brownian motion, some other references contradict these findings, so one cannot say anything for sure. It will take a clerk from the Swiss patent office, Albert Einstein, to develop the theory of the Brownian motion. Einstein approached the problem from a different perspective. Firstly, he applied the gas laws and the Stoke law, which had been developed for different purposes to the motion of particles suspended in the liquid. At the time, the applications of these laws, to our Brownian particles, was well beyond the known limits of the applicability of these laws. His motivations were different, so we will only stress, the two aspects of his paper, that are relevant to our discussion here. Recall the behavior of the gases as described by the kinetic theory, which view the gas as a collection of a large number of submicroscopic particles which are in constant and random motion. The random movements result from the collisions of the particles with each other and with the walls of the container. Hence, Einstein viewed the system of the suspended particles in the fluid as a collection of molecules. A microscopic view of the system would show the large particles in constant random motion, but the molecules of the liquid are much smaller and hence are not visible in the microscopic view. So that is the motion we see. Hence the Brownian motion is caused by, the collisions of the particles with the molecules of the fluid. Einstein offered a new mathematical perspective of the Brownian motion as well. Whilst previous research had focused, on the trajectory of a single particle over time, Einstein visualized this as the displacement of a collection, or an ensemble, of particles over a small time interval. To visualize this, let's first change our three-dimensional view to two dimensions which can be done by removing the depth from the view. Let's consider three particles now. Einstein was talking about a large collection, but we will visualize his idea with a collection of three particles. Assume the positions of the particles, at a given time, are as shown. Let's assume that after a short interval, the positions of the particles change as shown. Recall the hollow circle represents the initial position of a particle, and the filled circles then represent the position of the particle, of the same color, after a short interval of time. His definition of interval was a bit convoluted. He wanted the time interval to be small compared to the observed time interval, but not too small so that the displacements of a particle in two different intervals can be assumed to be independent. We can calculate the displacement of the particle, along one of the axis, 
say x-axis, easily. We start with the initial position of the particle, and draw a horizontal line, to the new position of the particle. This is the quantity that Einstein visualized as the object of main interest, for the mathematical model. You can imagine that for large collection of particles, we will have large number of displacements. Einstein assumed that the displacements have a probability distribution, which he assumed to be symmetric around zero. To help visualize the time dimension, or dynamic nature, of the displacement, we show the simulation of the displacements of the three particles over time. Recall the hollow circle represents the initial position of a particle, and the filled circles then represent the position of the particle, of the same color, after a short interval of time. The horizontal line represent the displacement in the given time interval. It is easy to see that the displacements of different particles in the same interval, and of the same particle in different intervals, are quite random. Now comes, the killer idea. Suppose, n, particles have been suspended in a liquid, and we will focus on the change in the x-coordinate of the particles' positions, as before. Let's reproduce our diagram of the displacements of the three particles. Let, f, represent the number of particle per unit volume, which is dependent on x, and, t only. The number of particles, at x, after a small time interval, would be then represented as follows. At a given time, if one were to count the number of particles in a small rectangle as drawn, it would just be, f times dx. Recall that we are only considering displacements in the x dimension, and the, dx, is to be imagined as very small. In our example, the number of particles in the picture as drawn is 1 at time t, the hollow circle, and 2 after the interval. Now the question, Einstein posed is as follow. Assuming we know the distribution of the particles at time t, and the probability distribution of the displacements, can we estimate the distribution of the particles after a small interval of time? If we were to use our picture as a guide, then what Einstein is saying amounts to this. We want to know how many filled circles are in the rectangle, assuming we know the hollow circles, and the distribution of the displacements, that is the distribution of the horizontal lines. The problem is easy to outline. A hollow circle will move inside the rectangle within a short time interval, if its x position when shifted by the displacement, will make it fall inside the rectangle. But as displacements can take infinite values, both positive and negative, we will need to weight it by its probability. Hence, we can write it as follows. As the probability of displacements was assumed to be symmetric around zero, we can replace minus sign in front of delta, with positive sign. Einstein then expand the, f functions on both sides, using Taylor expansion, and then simple calculations, give the diffusion differential equation. Let us know if you would like to see the step-by-step -step derivation, and we would be happy to share the details. Solving this equation, we get an expression very similar to the probability density of a normal. Now the diffusion coefficient is a variable, which will depends on the physics of the system. And as we are only interested in the mathematics, we can set it to any value we like. Setting it equal to 1 over 2, give more convenient representation. Dividing by n, gives the probability density of normal distribution. And now we know, where the normally distributed increments property come from. The theory of Brown in motion was, well developed and widely accepted, few years after Einstein published his paper. But it would be, Norbert Wiener approach, that would become the standard mathematical model for Brownian motion. If you ever wondered how it would be like to live the life, of an absent-minded professor, smoking cigars, and talking to yourself, then you should read more about Wiener. Also, did you notice the similarity in the first names of the three guys, Robert, Albert, and Norbert? So, what did Wiener did differently? We saw that Einstein approached the problem, as displacement of an ensemble of particles. Wiener focused on the dynamics of the path, followed by a single particle. To understand his approach, let's first visualize, the path of a single particle. Let's reproduce the two-dimensional view of our Brownian particle. As in Einstein approach, we will focus on one dimension, say y-axis this time. But this time, instead of displacement, we measure the distance from the horizontal axis. We plot this distance as function of time, and this gives us the trajectory of a single particle over time, as you can see in the diagram. Now this path looks like, a continuous function. 
we have sampled this using longer time intervals, but if one shortens the intervals, then this will indeed look continuous. So what did Wiener do next? He views the paths of the Brownian as continuous functions, and develop a measure to assign probabilities to these functions. In other words, he sees the space of paths, or curves as a collection to which probability is to be assigned. Hence, he generalizes the concept of probability well before the more abstract probability theory was developed. One can now calculate the probability of the Brownian path at any time to be between, say, alpha and beta as the integral of the normal density over the given range. And one can extend this to measure the probability of the paths, which at times, t1, through to, t, n, pass through the ranges, indicated by their index, as follows. This would become clear in the next few videos when we explore the Brownian motion properties from the modern perspective.